We're in the Westin oh. Hotel here at Austin, Texas. It looks like it gets a lot of natural light. South by Southwest. A lot of a lot of plants don't need, uh, you know, natural light. I guess it's I'm not making, getting. I'm not making getting stuff. Any up. natural light. I'm making stuff. That's up. why I thought it was not real. Right. But apparently it is. Sasha Watersfryer, director of Gary Winogrand, the uh, All Things Are Photographable, your new documentary. Is this? Uh, is this? Uh, how many films have you made uh, as a director? Well, I mainly I mainly make short, sort of avant-garde experimental films oh, in right. sixteen millimeter. Okay. So I've made a couple of longer films, but this is my first real like kind of conventional documentary. Feature. This is my first more conventional documentary. Gotcha. Well, congratulations. Thank you. It's it's thoroughly watchable. <laughs> I mean, that's quite an endorsement. And I'm going to tell people also that I, I while I had to do it in advance, so therefore I couldn't get to a screening. I did. I do have a, a monitor that I hook up my computer to, so I was watching it on a probably a Vimeo link, but on a larger screen. Oh, good. And I was just thinking, oh, my gosh. As good as it looks on that, think about watching it on the scale of a large screen because uh, every picture t- is like seeing a film in a sense that, you know, what, that's what m- makes a Gary and other street photographers as that are as talented as him. Their pictures are special. Right. And I think it's a really special way to experience his work, either for people who love him and know the work or for people who are being introduced the first time. Right. Because right. it's really different from looking at the work in, you know, flipping through a book or seeing it on yeah, the wall of a right. gallery or a museum. It's like you're seeing yeah. this whole sweep of images. There are about almost 400 uh, photographs by Winogrand in the film. Wow. So, And you're seeing them big. So you get to see the complexity yeah. The density of everything that he's kind of packing into every shot. Right. Uh, interestingly, there's not a lot of footage of Win- of Winogrand himself, right? There's like uh, no. some audio. There's mm-hmm. uh, obviously some photos and some, a little bit of like a few appearances, but you had to really work with around that. Uh, is, was that a big challenge for you? It was, and even of some of the material that exists. So, for example, there's a television interview that he did with a woman named Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel. So it was, uh, <laughs> right. So so Sasha Waters Fryer seems like nothing compared right, to that exactly. name. How did you just do the, pull that out? Say it again. <laughs> Barbara Lee Diamond. Sh- <laughs> no, no, I can't do it. <laughs> Barbara Lee Diamond Steen Spielvogel, because that's the name of her archive down at Duke. So it's a long. It's a, it's it's an hour long color. Oh, okay. Video. Right. I only use a few tiny pieces of it Is that because it just looks. Ter- you know, it's oh. that VHS. Sure, sure. Like even yeah. kind of being processed and, and going through post, oh, right. it and doesn't look good. And if you're not using it wh- ironically, right. it doesn't really work to your advantage. Right, exactly. And the same thing with the, there's a black and white Betamax tape of him teaching that's maybe an hour and a half long. And I use a lot of audio from that. Right. I only use a tiny piece of video from it. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, what What did you feel like you wanted to do? Did you want to, uh, were you interested in, well, maybe there's not an one or the other, maybe it's both, but were you more interested in... I don't know, presenting his this the, the work, the body of work mm-hmm. uh, to you know new audiences, or just share your your love of this photographer, or were you trying to kind of figure out this this artist? Sure, I think you know I, I, from start to finish, in terms of the very beginning, just starting to research him to finishing the film was about five years. So. I started shooting the film in August of 2013. So there's a lot of research that went into it, and I would say that my ideas about the film changed sort of as I went through the research and then as I started shooting interviews. I think in the beginning, I just thought, I'm really into this photographer. I want to spend more time with this work and sort of think about what it means, what we might be able to learn from it, both from the content of the work, the idea that he is able to make these images that kind of have all this chaos in them, but then still hold together, Mm -hmm. which is something that um, Aaron O'Toole, who's a curator at MoMA, says in the film, and also this idea of someone who shot so much well, yeah. before the digital age, like what could we learn from that? Yeah. But then as I began to film the interviews and get more invested in the research, I became more interested in him as a person and sort of his Makes sense. His, his struggles. Yeah, one of which was uh, just a practical struggle. He shot obsessively. I mean, uh, you know, it was just this, this was his personality. It was... He was very obviously stimulated visually mm-hmm. <laughs> walking around the city. Uh, did he shoot in mostly in, in New York? He shot, I think he's mostly known for his work in okay. New York, right. but he did crisscross the country on a couple of trips. So oh, there right. are these great photographs yes. from Michigan or from yeah. you know Nevada or wherever. Right. And then he lived in Texas in Austin for five years. Oh, and so at the end of his life, great... he lived in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Okay. 
he just took a, 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 such a quantity, and he didn't, I guess, have a staff of, of, <laughs> of assistant production assistants to, you know, develop and, and organize because he left a legacy of how many rolls of undeveloped about film? About 10,000 rolls of undeveloped okay, film, well, so almost a quarter of a million pictures. I know, 10,000, it's a lot. So he, I mean, what happens is that he... Like he, rolls of 36 exposures, that kind of thing? Yes. I mean, it, go, it depends. Yeah. And actually, some of them, because he was creating his own film canisters, some oh. are bigger, some are smaller because right. he's bulk loading. But what happens is that he's he's kind of keeping up with his processing and making mm -hmm. contact sheets while he's in New York. He falls behind periodically. But once he leaves New York, he comes to Austin. He doesn't really have a dark room. He has a um, he's married for the third time. He has a young child. He has his teaching. So he starts to fall behind, but he's still shooting, shooting, shooting. Then he gets to Los Angeles. He does start working with a dark room. He has a printer who he's working with at that point. But he's so far behind. Yeah. And, and, and I think he always had this idea that he would stop at some point and catch up. But right. then he didn't. No. So. Uh, tell this, this uh, anecdote about him carrying his son on his shoulder. He was already a little late in life, right? He's a, he was a latter-day oh, yeah. dad. I yes. myself am a latter-day dad. Yes. So I think one of the things I was really interested in with his personal story was the way in which his story challenged this sort of cliche or trope of artist biography, right? Yeah. I think a lot of times when we see artist biographies about male artists, the cliche might be, oh, well, he was a terrible husband or a terrible dad or a real asshole, but that's okay because we have this work. And right. I think with Gary Winogrand, you know, he wasn't a terrible person. He was actually a great person who a lot of love, but he was very conflicted, and he did go through two divorces, and and he did struggle to kind of find this balance between being a parent and doing his creative work, and which I think a lot of us can relate to. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of his life, again, he died very suddenly of cancer. He was only 56 years old. He had an 8-year-old daughter, and so one of the things that... Um, a photographer named Thomas Roma talks about in the film is this idea that Gary was slowing down because of his health, which was not that great for a lot of reasons, but he also was going out and photographing and taking his daughter with him because he wanted to spend time with her because he hadn't great. been able to spend time with his older kids. Yeah, right. So it's, it's very moving, and I think, when, yeah. when Tom Roma talks about that. Yeah, he does, right. That's the one that, that figures out by looking at these photographs. Right. Uh, which were, were those developed after Gary was gone? Right. So Tom Roma was yeah. one of the three cur three curators At of the MoMA? posthumous show. Okay. He's a photographer who worked with MoMA to do the posthumous show in 1988. Okay. And through going through these rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls of this posthumous work, he could see um, sort of in the contact sheets, you see Gary's feet when he's loading the film. And oh, then right. he sees There's Melissa's the, feet. The, uh, but a lot of people are growing up now without... Um, Film cameras, right? People don't their, know what contact they don't under, are. They don't know what. Con well, yes, that's right. And, except for again, in a kind of a art art direction decision to include a contact sheet, right? In a in a magazine expose or something. But that the fr when you loaded the camera, you are shut. Uh, what's the term? Moving when you're, you're advancing advancing the film, the film in, in the, through the spool ahead, and so you want to get to the first full frame. And so you usually have a dis you, you're clicking through. You're taking pictures of nothing usually right. with the camera lens on. And, and you're just fact. kind of pointing at the ground. And you right. And you're exactly so. Those images kind of gave clues to what he was doing when he was taking the pictures because it turned out that he had on his daughter on his shoulders. At, right. Yeah. For, so you it's see, it's really right. funny. Like like the concept that that could be in itself a like a, a an art piece that these these images that are taken accidentally or unintentionally, whatever. Right. It was really amazing role. to go through the contact sheets and really pay attention to those sort of non-image images to see where is he, what shoes is he wearing, what's you know, who is he with, right? Because yeah. then you do start to see at this certain time in his life that he's with he's with his daughter quite frequently when he's photographing. Yeah. For you, who's making a film about somebody you never met, mm -hmm. ostensibly, it's a it's an interesting kind of clue in the puzzle. Talk about your making the film. That again, it's called Gary Winogrand. All things are photographable, and it's having its uh, world world premiere world premiere here in uh, in, uh, in Austin, Texas, which is a good spot to do that in, uh, since he lived here. I mean, how did you decide which? You said there were some four four hundred photos that are uh, there are about four hundred photographs in the in film this, in this movie. Uh, uh, just did, how did you? Well, how many did you have to go through to? Were you looking at? Well, I don't think there's any one person 
ever who's looked at every single contact sheet. <laughs> because even right. in 88, there were the three curators and they split up the work. Oh. And I had people helping me, in particular, I had people helping me look for the photographs of the feet because that's just sort of going through the ends. Right. And then I had another a, a friend who's a wonderful photographer, Jeffrey Ladd, who's based in Cologne, Cologne, Germany. He helped a lot with the research and going through contact sheets, looking for sort of new winograms. Um, so there are about 35 new photographs by winogram that have never been seen before. Like, we found them in the contact sheets. Right. So that was really exciting. Some of them are from as early as the 1950s. Some of them are the late posthumous work. And then uh, in terms of the other images that we chose, I wanted to include a lot of the color work because that's work that's really rarely seen by him. And then it was sort of a mix of iconic images that people might know, like the interracial couple with the chimpanzees or the yeah. laughing woman with the ice cream cone. There's the girls on the park bench. And the, Yes, the girls on the park bench, which we see a couple of times. And then also... It, the film unfolds chronologically, and so there are pictures, when we're talking about particular books, that I'm drawing the pictures from those books mm -hmm. and trying to just keep keep it to the strong... Like, I don't particularly care for the book Women Are Beautiful, but keep keeping that section of the film limited pretty much to those pictures yeah. sort of needed to happen for the integrity of the film. So what's your relationship now with this person, this artist, this photographer? Huh, it's such a funny... Thing because he is deceased. I mean, it's not like making a film about a living person where you have that yeah. personal relationship. But I do feel, you know, I, I feel really, I was very lucky. It was, I mean, very privileged to have a wonderful relationship with the estate. So his ex, his third wife, who's his widow, yes. manages the estate. And she and the Frankel Gallery were just incredibly generous in terms of just giving me a lot of freedom. And then his two older children are a little bit older than me, Ethan and Lori, who mm -hmm. you see in the film. So I'm in touch with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel, I mean, I mean we, grew, we all grew up in New York kind of around the same time. So right. I feel connected to them in that way. Or yeah. even his first wife, who you see in the film, you know, she's, she's, like, so, she's like every like older woman in the neighborhood that I grew up with. So, yeah. so I feel that kind of, um, like we're from the same village, I, I guess I would say. You speak say. the same language, shorthand. Yeah. Like, and did they, what did the family think of your film? So, Eileen... You, I mean, did you... I, I assume you gave them an advance. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah but they haven't all seen it. Oh, okay. They're going to see here? Are they here? No, they're going to see it in San Francisco. So, Eileen, okay. his wife, his ex his widow, yeah. has seen it. Okay. And... But his children, I have not seen it. So, Ethan Winogrand oh. told me he wasn't ready to see it. Really? And I think we're... I mean, I, if this film screens in Spain, he lives in Spain, oh, so okay. I'm hoping that we can do a screening together in Spain. Sure. But I told him, I was like, I think you should see it before you watch it in public. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it could be a very emotional yeah. experience. I, I mean, it will be. It's inevitably. A, uh, of course it is. Yeah, and I'm sure it's strange for them to yeah. have right. well, did, uh, someone come did, along and make a film about their dad. Did Did Gary, uh, did he have a, a following in Europe? I mean, is there a large, do you know? Are you familiar or aware of, of whether there's a... Uh, of, you know, but like he has a base of a following in, in uh, Europe. You know, in uh, when there was this big retrospective in 2013, it was at SF MoMA, the National Gallery, and okay. the Met. And right. then in Europe, it went to it went to the Jeu de Palme. So I know he's got a big following in France. France. Okay. Yeah, in Paris. Right. And then yeah. I feel like it was... I guess you don't know unless you go there and try it right, out. Right, it might have been one more place. Maybe it may have been in Spain. Okay. Yeah, so it'll uh, it'll be interesting to see how the film plays internationally. Yeah. It might be a little too American, mm -hmm. which sometimes is sorry, a good Nick. thing, or sometimes it's not, right? Yeah. It's not really about America, but... Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think photographs, regardless of the subject, can be... I mean, it's about photography, which it, is very yeah. universal. And people are universal. And right. <laughs> These are these and other sage observations will be continued mm -hmm. during the course of this conversation. Anyway, um, you saying this was the world premiere, so, so this I is the have world an premiere. Do you have something in you know other another festival set up or that you can talk about? Or I do, but I don't know if I can tell you. Yeah, no, don't. It's fine. <laughs> so yeah, there's more, I don't. More, I do. I have a couple more festivals lined up, but they haven't been announced publicly right. yet. No, no, don't do that. Because okay. uh, I mean, I could of course wait to put this out, but I, I, I'll do whatever Susan wants me to do yeah. as far as helping your film in any way. I little way I can uh, you know uh, so you had uh, how was you had your premiere obviously already mm -hmm. did you have a second screening yet or no my second screening will be tomorrow, tomorrow and the third screening on Thursday 
Okay. And how so. did your how did your premiere go? What did the audience think? I think the premiere went really great. I was a little nervous at sure. eleven o'clock on a Monday. Okay. But it got a nice Yeah, there was a really good turnout and it was exciting and people responded well and I sat in the back and s- tried to gauge the energy of the room, you know, which is hard. hard to do. It is hard with the documentary. I mean, you can only you can you can gauge the energy of the room if it's bad. Right? Yeah. Like oh, if right. people are shifting around Sh- a right. lot. Right, leaving. Leaving. That's, that's <laughs> There's always a <laughs> small clue. Yeah, into exactly. So, but people seem, you know, pretty wrapped and. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was that was really it was great, and I've I've had I have just this film has just had like the stars align and the heavens smile upon it, and how many amazing people I have been lucky enough to work with. So just I got involved with American Masters and Submarine pretty early oh, on. Wow. Like yeah. Submarine got involved based on like a two minute trailer. I mean. And they were incredible. And uh, Susan, the of bronze, course. The, the bronze, bronze yes. brothers. Yeah. yeah. And, and David then you Poe. Get a, right. Yeah. And then you get a blue chip publicist. I know. She's Susan the best. Margit, she's totally amazing. Absolutely. So I just feel really. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's like Gary is magic. Yeah. Well, People I, just I was around. told. I was, this was put on my radar by. I'm going to give a shout out. And I know he's listening. Uh, photographer. Godless, who's a, a street photographer himself, or oh yeah, even though he's known as a rock rock photographer, but he's also he's a really good photographer. You know, I did a uh, I recently uh, did a Kickstarter campaign, and he came up to me for and his he book, goes, or for your no, he, oh, he for did you. The, he did oh, one okay. as well for his book. That's right, but I did one for my podcast and more of my oh. business. And and Godless, he, you know, he came up to me. And he goes, I know you're doing a, a Kickstarter, and you know, I'll print some photos up for you. He printed a. Uh, a few copies of this one with Agne- Agnes Varda, uh, Jim Jarmish, and Martin Scorsese, and I was able to use them as rewards. Oh, and that's they, so I brought, great! In fact, the guy, one of the a filmmaker friend who's hosting me here in Austin, won, won one of the Agnes Vardas. So I brought it with me and hand delivered it. Um, oh, that's great! Right from Godless, you know, to him, and he's also the official kind of photographer at the the, the Link Film Society for the Fe- Film Society of Lincoln Center. Oh, okay. So he does a lot of he photographs the New York Film Festival and mm-hmm. other events. Anyway. But he he put your he said you you know I was he says you, I saw the uh, Gary Winogrand documentary and you got to get this filmmaker on she's great. yeah he came to a sneak preview in New York right so I met him there yeah that was wonderful and he was I guess and that's where I met Susan too right and he mm-hmm. and he said Susan's a closet Winogrand fan so she so they were all excited about your documentary so and I got to see it and I feel the same congratulations yeah, and thanks. I look forward to more from from uh, <laughs> Sasha Waters Fryer and. <laughs> And I look forward to us meeting with Jonathan Saffron Foer. <laughs> to just and we're gonna just we're gonna have a podcast where it's everyone with there's the a new double document. last name. He did involve Hillary he's Rodham Clinton. Animals. Hillary Rodham Clinton can All be right. there. Well, that's not as confusing though. But but Laura I, Ingalls Wilder, but she's not alive anymore. No, no. Uh, just stick, the there's name? many, many. But Jonathan Saffron Foer is involved. He wrote a book a couple of years back called Eating Animals, and they've made it in. It is now part of it. It's now a documentary that he's involved with. Oh. So I was hoping to bring him on. Not here, but eventually when I get it. Oh, I think yeah. It I read about that book. I didn't know it, it was a documentary. it premiered at Hot Docs. Okay. No, no, excuse me. It premiered at Doc NYC or something okay. like that. Anyway, okay. thank you. Very, I'm distracted. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, was this was so great. Thank you so much.